I haven't really done anything with this burp instance except for activate the pro license. I installed a few of the extensions, but I will show you how to do the actual installation. I just wanted to make sure that they were there, they were ready, and we didn't hit any hiccups uh, for some of the things I'm gonna show you. So we're gonna do a temporary project here because we're not really interested in the projects being saved for our purposes today. I'm using burps default, so we're not really doing anything drastic or crazy. So if you've never messed around with Burp uh, before, I do have a video out there, webcast from before, uh, maybe it was two or three months ago, that talks about some of the basics of Burp and what it is, what it does, what the main few functions of it are. And that way uh, you can get caught up to the point that we're starting at now, which is talking about extensions. What are the extensions? Right here on the tab, it's very clear. These are Portswigger's Burp, extensions they are not all developed by portswigger uh, there are a few i believe that are out there from their research team and things like that but i believe that most of them are community based burp does when they pull it into the uh, into the burp extension store which they call vap store so i'll reference it as vap store b a p p store they do host that code in a source GitHub that they own. So for example, this .NET Beautifier, which we're not actually going to be talking about, they have the source link here when you have it selected. And it pulls it up and you can see it's GitHub under Port Swigger's account. So Port Swigger, and then it has it there. So you are pulling code from a GitHub that is controlled by Port Swigger itself. There's a level of trust that's involved there. Port Swigger is a security organization. They do this stuff as their primary business. They do their due diligence mostly. I, I've never had an issue pulling from the from the store, but I want to make sure I call out that these are public and community built extensions for the most part. All these columns up here, they're sortable. We're just going to talk about what each one of them are real quick so that you have some understanding of what the extension store is, what uh, the information means. Here you've got a column that just shows you what's installed, what's not. The checkbox of installed does not necessarily mean that that extension is, quote, loaded in your current project. A loaded extension means it's ready to use. An installed extension means that it's, a, it's capable of being loaded. I believe the default when you install a, uh, an extension is it will default to loading it immediately. Assuming there are no errors with its installation, it will immediately try to start it up. So for instance, we've got this installed for AutoWasp, and you can see up here, an AutoWasp tab has here, and that's because it is loaded. I'll show you how that works a little bit later. We've got a ratings tab. This is ratings and popularity. I, could, I can provide feedback on this. Anybody using it can provide feedback for ratings of these tools, and then they kind of sort on popularity. As you can see, these five that we're going to talk about, they kind of range in how popular they are, but they're all pretty much four stars or higher rated. You can have ones that aren't rated at all and ones that are all the way down two star and up. It depends, right? So the community is giving feedback on how good these are. So you should have some level of expectation on how they operate. There's also an indication on when the extension was last updated. You wanna to try to use extensions that are updated more frequently. Not that there's anything wrong with these extensions. It could be that there's nothing new that needed to be developed in the last nine years. They work, they work well, they do their job, and they just haven't seen a reason to update them. The maintainer could have moved on to other, other things. That's fine. As we can see from our installed sorting though, all of the extensions that we're going to be talking about have been updated sometime in the last couple of years. So they're, they're fairly frequent, which is probably why they have a high rating and a decent popularity is that somebody is maintaining them actively. This next uh, column in here for system impact is something that Portswigger added to Burp pretty recently, actually. If you start loading up way too many extensions, you're going to have a real concern about how well your system is going to perform. We're operating within a virtual machine right here. So we want to make sure that we be mindful of any sort of impact. So it says system impact is low. If you go over to the right where there's some details as you click through them, you get a little bit more of a gauge as to what it, what it means, your memory impact, your CPU impact, how much time it takes to, to do the job of this on top of what Burp does by default in its vanilla version or vanilla capabilities. And then scanner low. So all these ones are pretty low. Let's check through low, low, low. 
no real pains for any of the ones that we're going to be talking about today on your system. And I chose these five, particularly because these are things that I normally will have loaded up by default when I start a new engagement. They're good to have on hand so that they're running at all times. You can jump over and use them. These are by no means the only ones. You can see, I don't know how many are in here. I should probably look for an actual list of how many extensions they have. They have quite a lot of extensions. Not a lot of them are rated above low for the impact. I think there's one that's high in here. One, two, a handful that have a high impact. So those ones you want to make sure you can have them installed, but you don't want to have them loaded. And I'm about to show you what the difference is there and how you do that. So right underneath here, we have extensions selected, and then we get a few sub tabs installed. We have them installed and available. The little checkbox over here means it's loaded. Pretty straightforward. It will default after an installation for trying to have it loaded up as an available extension to you. If it adds a tab into your UI, it'll add that tab. Some extensions don't add tabs. They do things behind the screen, behind the scenes, such as this retired JS. There is no tab added to my interface. It does things passively as I, as I use systems. Let's see if I can do Exif Tool Scanner. So it's loaded right now, and it's right up here for the tab. We'll uncheck that, and that tab goes away. You can see up here the total estimated system impact bar moving a little bit. Like I said, this is a fairly new addition from Portswigger, so I'm, I don't know how accurate it is, to be honest. But at least gives you some warm and fuzzies about how much you have loaded up and where. And if you do have a lot of extensions installed and you start enabling too many of them, loading too many of them, you can start to see your impact to your system really climb. So I'll go ahead and re-enable this. Process started, this little extension window popped up. I'll go ahead and close this. Exif tool scanner is re-enabled and it's right here back as a tab. So we're back in business with that one. And you can see my, while all of these are system impact low, the total system impact from having all five is now medium, moderate. I don't remember the exact configuration of this machine. I don't think Burp takes into account what your machine's specific hardware configuration or virtual hardware configuration you have for, for memory and CPU and all of those things. I think these are just base ratings of it's, it's a pretty low impact. So your mileage may vary, basically. One of the other things that I want to show you for extensions before we actually start using them is this little guy right here. Under extensions and options, there is a Python environment setting for the config. I'm calling this out specifically because some of the tools, including one of the ones that we're going to be using, showing you today, requires what's called a Jython standalone jar file. These are pretty easy to, to pull down. I've already pulled it down. This is the URL for it, jython.org slash download. You want to hit that Jython standalone link right there. Pull it down, keep it somewhere where you'll know, and then you simply select the file. Basically, what's happening here is if you have an extension, it sometimes will have these requirements and it will list Jython. If you don't have that Jython file, this is not going to work. And you can try to search here. There's a little search function up here in the top right of the BAP store. So all of these, when I reference Jython, all of these come back. Again, we're not talking about most of them, but to give you an idea, there are a lot of extensions, some of them do require this extra file to run properly. So the last column inside of this uh, BAP store layout of details is the detail column. This column will show you what extensions require a pro license for Portswigger's Burp and the ones that you can do with the community edition of, of Burp. And like I said, I've got the pro license enabled here. There are going to be two extensions that we'll talk about this time around that are requiring that license. Most of the extensions do not require pro license. There is nothing in that detail field. These are all extensions that don't have to have a pro license. And if there's no value in there, that means that you can use this with the community free edition of Burp. That kind of covers the BAP store itself. It covers the Jython file, the installation that we have, and it covers how we load extensions after they've been installed. As a side note, if you are an internal pen tester and you're, I've been in this situation before, if you're an internal pen tester and you are using this inside of a corporate network that has some blocking as to which sites you can get to, 
BERT is pulling this from a port swigger site. So if your organization is blocking port swigger site, you're not going to be able to install these. You're not going to be able to pull the BAP store directly. There are manual ways to pull down the files and port them over into BERT itself and then load, install and load them manually. We're not going to go over that now. That's a little bit too much in the weeds, uh, but there is a way around that. Just don't feel disheartened if you're in that situation. The extensions do help because some of them really do increase your capability. I wouldn't say it, that that's the main reason it differentiates itself. OWASP Zap is, for those not familiar, is another interception proxy. It's developed by the same people that develop the, the OWASP Juice Shop, and they put it out there for free. So what that means is, of course, it is subject to all your community-supported things. It's certainly a very great tool. One of the limitations I mentioned, if you don't have a Burp Pro license, is they do kind of throttle some of the functionality in the Burp Community Edition. Still a lot there, but they throttle some of it, especially around Burp's intruder functionality. But that paid license, that paid support, a whole company that's built around this tool, the research they do, all that stuff, their functionality inside of Burp is just, it's just cleaner. It's better. It's better developed, better maintained, not putting down a wasp. This is a question that comes up every time we talk about Burp or interception proxies at all. Do I need to pay that license? No, you don't need to pay it to get to know things. But if you are doing a web application or API pen testing as your job, I absolutely recommend using Burke uh, profession. It, it will drastically help you. <laughs>